I'd like to thank you for joining us and welcome you to our discussion, Philanthropy and the Road to Recovery, Supporting Innovations in Entrepreneurship and Workforce Development. Uh, COVID-19 has dealt a huge blow to the U.S. economy and workforce. Tens of millions of Americans are out of work. The unemployment rate hit 14.7% at one point in 2020. And at this point in the pandemic, each one of us has begun to read about and perhaps personally witness the failure and closure of businesses that just couldn't hold on any longer. It is discouraging to watch the life's work of so many entrepreneurs be obliterated. It is frustrating to see some fellow Americans respond so cavalierly, and it's heartbreaking to witness the personal hardship that widespread unemployment has engendered. Any further recovery effort must immediately put people back to work rather than further galvanize incentives not to work. As if a global pandemic were not enough, the surfacing of racial tensions has caused considerable strife. One upside of an intensified conversation about race and opportunity, however, has been a call to expand opportunities to engage in entrepreneurial activity, wealth creation, and job creation in communities that have traditionally struggled to gain such access. This session will examine the role of philanthropy in supporting the development of work opportunities, especially in light of the current crises. We will be joined by two philanthropists who are making unconventional investments in the development of innovative solutions to the problems I've just described. All of the projects they describe aim to yield both social and financial return in one way or another. They will describe their philosophy of impact investing and discuss the importance of removing regulatory barriers, seeing citizens return to work, and launching new businesses. So with us today, we have Jay Hine, who is the president of the Sagamore Institute and the managing director of Commonwealth, a venture philanthropy organization that connects entrepreneurs with philanthropists to accelerate businesses that strengthen communities. And Commonwealth has current investments in Florida, Indiana, North Carolina, and Texas, as well as Guatemala, Israel, and Rwanda. Did I get that right? <laughs> also joining our conversation today is Peter Lipset, who is Vice President of Donors Trust, where he fosters its growth by overseeing marketing, client outreach, and prospect cultivation. Peter also oversees this Growth and Resilience Fund, which was created to address the very issues we're broaching in this panel discussion. Um, and we're going to have this conversation in two parts. The first part, we're going to sort of lay out the landscape uh, uh, currently. And the second part, we're gonna discuss solutions. So I think I would kick it off by saying to Peter and Jay, I think we all agree that work is central to the vitality of our free enterprise system, um, but it's also vital to the health of our nation's communities and to the well-being of its citizens. Uh, working citizens contribute to the tax base rather than draw from it, but they are also better participants in civic and community affairs. This has been well documented. Um, above all, we're seeing, um, uh, we're seeing unfold before us the unprecedented rapid expansion of welfare and the idleness it foments is a threat to the dignity of American citizens. So just a general question for both of you, has civil society demonstrated its strength and reminded Americans of its relevance in the wake of COVID-19, or is its deterioration more evident than ever? I think it's a little bit of both, Alicia. Let me first agree with your premise. Um, we all um, across the nation need to be contributors to um, our community well-being, and we need to use the gifts uh, we've been given to, uh, to be individual contributors. That's a, um, that's a dignity point. And so we know that when others try to do for others um, that uh, demoralizes, excludes, and it leads to some of the deterioration because the part of civil society that's fraying, we see in the form of loneliness or um, um, crime or, or other social ills that come from really two things, I think fundamentally. One is just a low view of self. Um, a a non-contributor is likely to have a low view of self if they're on the sidelines. Um, and also just a, a lack of um, economic opportunity. Um, so these things go together. The more that we're able to unleash entrepreneurship from the bottom up, and this takes us to the um, enlivening of civil society, um, part of your question, um, the, the um, rewards that come from healthy participation in the workforce, these things build self-esteem. 
um, and create social capital, um, but indeed give us economic uplift as well. So policy matters because it incentivizes or disincentivizes one's participation in society. And the heart of your question, I think, is we need to be very active incentivizing healthy and robust participation by all of our neighbors. Yeah, and I kind of think civil society is this latent value we have. I mean, it's critical. We all know it's critical. And we've seen that. I think a lot of civil society organizations have really stepped up in this crisis. And it's important for us to realize that there's multiple levels to that, and, and our conversation will explore that. I mean, there's the, the straight humanitarian, the give a man a fish piece that's really important, and civil society is, is able to do that. And a lot of philanthropists kind of instinctually go to that. There's the teach a man a fish, which is really the essence of what some of the stuff we'll be talking about here. But I say there's a third piece of that too, which is there's places where it's illegal to fish in the first place. And policy organizations and, and nonprofits have a role in stripping away some of those, those barriers, uh, be they to employment, uh, regulations to who can do what, uh, the tax base, all of these things. And as we think about philanthropy, it should be sometimes the most humane thing is to actually think in the policy world. And, uh, and I'm excited to talk some about that today. Sure, so Peter, let's jump right into that. Um, what are some of the specific structural barriers that Donors Trust identified um, in, in the immediate wake of the, the nationwide lockdown, for example? Of course, these are things that existed before to varying degrees, but um, what, what was it that happened in the wake of the lockdown that prompted you to um, uh, launch the, pro the project that you are working on? And um, would you mind describing a few of the solutions? You're going to get into that a little bit more yeah. later. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, to be clear, like, it was a little less donors trust identifying what uh, some of these institutional problems were and just realizing that we were in a position to help all these organizations that are out there who are quickly uh, doing stuff and yeah. getting stuff going. Um, particularly because one of the things we noticed early on was that there was a lot of money on the sidelines. A lot of the foundation money of foundations were kind of taking us a, a wait and see approach to things, uh, which is fine and it actually makes a lot of sense, but there's also a lot of energy out there to, to do something, right, um, amongst philanthropists and there wasn't a clear direction to that, but we knew as employment fell, as people's savings slipped away, uh, that something needed to be done and so what we launched at Donors Trust was our growth and resilience project and the goal there was to really get money to the groups that identified some of these very problems that, that we're going to talk about so that people could get back to work, so that entrepreneurs could feel confident taking the risks they needed to do and, and get government out of the way from taking too much advantage of the crisis, frankly. Um, and so we really focused on four major pillars. Those were employment and job creation, uh, economic uh, deregulation, the barriers to entry, particularly in education and healthcare, that were stopping a lot of the two big, uh, big problems from actually getting solved, and countering the narratives to the crisis intervention and the government overreach. Because uh, while there's real problems to be solved, more problems were also being created by the stories being spun. And I think the two biggest areas that we really saw organizations in the policy space stepping up and saying, you know what, we can actually be a valuable contributor to a solution here was in that regulatory pushback space um, and also in that information space. There were a lot of groups uh, who were ready to pull down those barriers, um, but also a lot of groups that were ready to, um, to talk about some of these problems and hindrances that we saw out there. And so I, later on, I'll give some of the examples and talk through some of it, but th that's a lot of what we were really focused on is just how do we strip away the barriers to let people actually get back to work uh, and make sure that false narratives aren't out there making government grow. So Jay, as, as you, you know a lot about false narratives and how to counter them, and um, I think in a time when um, um, there's a heightened sense of concern and a sort of, we have to do something about this and people turn toward the government, we lose sight of the appropriate narrative. So I guess the, the question I'd like to ask you is, um, can you characterize why a free market oriented response to job creation is the humane response and why we shouldn't be leaning into the federal government during a time of crisis. For sure, so I think it was Ronald Reagan um, teasing his economists, um, said you know, they'd like to see something in action and wonder if it would work in theory. 
And I think that's what's going on here is that civil society isn't a new policy solution. Civil society is the neighborliness that has been in the um, crux of our national experiment. Um, so this idea of national, I think, needs to be recaptured more than federal. Um, since the, you know, the welfare state era, if you will, we have done just what you prompted, Alicia, and, and that's see some type of problem in society and elites driving us toward who to elect or what law to pass or what budget appropriation to, to move forward. Policy does matter. We said it in the first um, answer, but um, people matter more. And the job creators, the health providers, the educators, these are people in practice day after day um, that are the actual first responders in any crisis. First responders aren't the Department of Homeland you know, Services or anybody else. It's, it's us in our neighborhoods, caring for neighbor, eyes on each other in the sort of village context, neighborhood context. So this idea of localism and human scale needs to be elevated uh, dramatically in, in our conversation. But to go directly to your second question now to me is that enterprise is the only solution to poverty in human history. Um, so what we need to do is enable um, markets to work and we need to enable workers to participate in economies. And of course, in times of, of challenge, the economic crisis of 08 or the pandemic now, um, it takes creative solutions. And this is why I go back to if enterprise are the solutions, then entrepreneurs um, are the solutions generators and we need more of them and they need to be better rewarded. I want to ask a question to the two of you. Um, we've talked, we've alluded to barriers. Um, we haven't talked with specifics about barriers, but we can't have a proper discussion of the landscape without acknowledging that these are barriers that existed before the pandemic. Um, there are lots of them, uh, legal barriers presented by an inability to escape one's criminal history, despite evidence of personal change. Um, regulatory barriers, as you've already um, uh, discussed a little bit, um, burdensome li licensure requirements, uh, a lack of access to capital. And do you, Peter and Jay, think that COVID-19 presents a setback for all the efforts to alleviate those barriers? Or is there sort of a silver lining in the opportunity to take a pause? Yes, I think that there is a silver lining. Um, I think that I think barriers, conversation matters, Alicia, and I'll let Peter maybe speak more directly to that since they've done really terrific uh, research and, and policy work around it. But I also want to reintroduce the concept of disincentives, um, which, you know, really are barriers of another form. Um, so when, um, when we can combat prejudice, perhaps, about a returning citizen um, getting appropriate housing or, or employment, um, you know, some of that has to do again with policy, but more of it has to do with culture and behavioral change. And so, you know, the Greeks like to talk about exemplaries, um, those who are best practices and leading us forward. And so I think um, we need a lot of new civil society champions that are showing us new ways and incentivizing um, through inspiration, but also, you know, market reward, um, the, uh, the workarounds or the, the problem solving that's necessary to help those who are just underemployed or excluded from the workforce. And I think the, the COVID crisis really exposed a bunch of these barriers that were causing friction. You know, they're, they're little minutia things that maybe some public servant put in there with, with some good intention, but you know, New York for a time couldn't get the doctors it needed because they literally just weren't allowed to practice in the state. And that was not just true of New York, that was in New Jersey and a number of other states. And so that was one of those early regulations that actually fell, of these uh, medical license uh, portability that would recognize licenses from other states. And those, that, that story repeated over and over again. You had uh, people suddenly working at home that may be in a different tax jurisdiction from where their office is, and suddenly there's a big tax question of, well, where should they actually be taxed? Uh, and maybe they're getting taxed, could be taxed a lot less now that they're working at home, but you know, a city like New York doesn't want to lose that money. This is a place where some of this policy-oriented philanthropy can rise up. Uh, that's not going to 
get rid of the virus, but it's going to help get rid of some of those barriers, knock on uh, challenges that come as a result of having to face this. So I think it's exposed a ton of stuff that, that we don't need. And, and I'll talk a little bit later about Competitive Enterprises Institute's uh, program called Never Needed, which is one of the things funded through the Growth and Resilience Project that uh, is essentially asks the question, if we were okay tearing these regulations down during the pandemic, do we really need them when the pandemic is over? Alicia, one other quick point about silver lining. Um, human capital formation, of course, is, is, a, is a critical thread that runs through this conversation because another barrier, of course, is one's um, lack of preparedness to participate in the economy and that a monopoly in, in public education has not done much to help um, problem solve around that. But in a time that, that we're in right now, we're seeing so much education innovation enabled out of necessity. Um, so if we can excel um, in creative, um, proven solutions, maybe we can create an enduring sort of policy work around um, the furtherance of choice and other uh, methods to bolster non-traditional uh, solutions, the, the rise of the technical college system to be highly adaptive to uh, employer needs. Um, there's a potential for accelerated innovation. Thank you for saying that. It's very tempting to take this conversation down the road of education reform right now, but I'm going to resist that temptation. And I want to try to turn the conversation um, toward solutions and what, what philanthropists, whether venture philanthropists or traditional philanthropists or anything in between, um, can begin to do about this, uh, about the problems that we've talked about. Um, but I want to ask you, each of you a question about this sort of current moment um, uh, sort of as a philanthropist, but Peter, first, um, there, there's increased need from nonprofits. Anybody who works in philanthropy can, can see that. Um, a global pandemic could be a convenient foil for organizations that were already struggling with finances or governance. Um, how does one determine who's got an opportunity to do something creative and is willing to act on that or able to act on that? And who is simply replacing lost revenue without making other adjustments? Right, right. Uh, you know, a crisis can certainly separate the wheat from the chaff a little bit. And we certainly had some applications come into the Growth and Resilience Project. Uh, you know, one came in and just straight up said they need this funding to, quote, hit their number. We can weed those out pretty quick, right? Because that wasn't the point. Uh, the, the point was to do this very narrow focus of building up employment and job creation, letting entrepreneurs get back to work, stripping away regulation. So I think the, the answer to the question there is the big point of having a vision of what you want to achieve and then being willing to be nimble and accept, accept some failure, right? It, we're talking about a venture philanthropy model here. I knocked the foundations a little bit because they didn't move very fast in the crisis. On the other hand, what I did here in talking to, to people in this room and, and to, to others is, well, we're going to keep giving to the organizations that we've been giving to. So they weren't looking for venture models, but they were the savior for organizations to carry them through. And so those philanthropists with an appetite for venture, for willing to do stuff, stuff like what we were doing with this project and the, the donors who came along beside us in it, uh, they were the ones who were ready to, to take a little bit of risk. Now we created some accountability because we said, you're, if we give you this money, you're going to need to report back to us. And so there's a bit of reputational risk. And knowing that some of the projects may not pan out, maybe there's not an audience for it, maybe political pressures just made it impossible to achieve what they wanted to achieve, that's okay, as long as they're being you know, genuine about trying to, to move forward with it. And so we really, one of the, when I was in business school, one of the things that still kind of shocks me to this day is this idea that you know, you think creatives just want to go all over the place. Creatives like having boundaries. And so with, when you're doing venture philanthropy like this, putting some boundaries on it, that gives people a lot of space to think creatively, but also uh, gives them someplace, a wall to hit at some point so that they can be boxed in a little bit and think, think smart. So, you know, one quick example, uh, the Mercatus Center, uh, George Mason University was one of our grantees. We gave them $50,000 to really ramp up their marginal revolution university. And I asked Dan Rothschild who runs Mercatus, you know, did this grant, were you gonna do this anyway? Um, and he said, you know, truthfully, we probably would have tried it. We may have done a little, but we would have put nowhere near the resources in. 
uh, and having somebody put faith in us to, with those resources, really let us uh, put it first, put accountability on them and let them run. Um, but it gave them the runway they need to really experiment uh, at a time when they're trying to conserve other revenues for this thing that's really shifted a lot of the, a lot of what they do. And so it let them do something unproven and they were successful be, because of it. And so with venture philanthropy, you can put people over the top. Uh, and, you know, at least I'd love to throw this actually back at you, because I know you at the Bradley Foundation, as you think about some of the civil society grants you do, you're taking a kind of venture model, too. So you probably have some smart stuff to add to that as terms of what philanthropists should and shouldn't look for. Uh, I, I guess I would just say that um, we are probably um, taking the um, slow and steady approach that um, might, have, might have been a cause of frustration for, for you early on, um, but it's with intention. And I really liked what Jay said about um, first responders in any crisis, um, uh, even in the absence of a crisis, um, we're looking to make philanthropic investments in the sort of first responders in our society. So we're, we're always looking for leadership um, uh, versus management. Uh, and we're always sort of looking at the grants that we make as an investment in someone's talent uh, and potential and uh, in order to sort of be a little bit more, give them a little more flexibility to sort of run with their ideas, um, our, our approach is to make uh, largely general operations grants um, to give them the, the sort of freedom and latitude to be flexible and to try and fail. So that's been sort of our approach. And I would say it's slightly different from what Donors Trust is doing, but I, I would say compatible. We have a lot of similar grantees. And yours is taking a longer term approach, not a, you know, a crisis specific approach either. For sure. Um, Jay, I'd like to ask you a question uh, that's slightly different about this moment in time. Um, there's increased pressure uh, for all kinds of reasons that are obvious to everyone listening to this conversation, uh, to invest in minority businesses. Um, this is something you've been doing for many, many years. And um, I, I guess the question I have for you is, are individual entrepreneurs and um, entrepreneurship intermediary, intermediaries um, being properly vetted in a moment where there's a real fever to, to sort of throw a lot of money in that kind of direction? Um, do they have sound, sound planning and finances? Um, what is the healthy balance between capitalization and just subsidizing cash flow so that a business will collapse when it's left to its own devices? Well, that's right. You, uh, you said at the top that we had a, a health crisis that um, created an economic dilemma um, for sure, but then we had a social unrest that accelerated that and taken together, um, I think the number somewhere near 50% of black owned businesses that have closed this year is a stunning statistic. And it shows the vulnerability of um, the lack of infrastructure and access to capital, um, sometimes business talent um, necessary to navigate a lack of social capital. Um, so we've been deeply uh, inspired to come alongside a, a Dallas Cowboys football player, actually, who's that's still his day job, um, but who created something called the Minority Entrepreneurship Institute, which Sagamore helps fuel. Um, and it goes to the heart of your question. So seeing that there needs to be a skills gap filled, really there's a two gaps. We need to close the economic gap and the educational gap for minority entrepreneurs who we think are the best solution um, to the wealth gap generally. Um, it's about a 10X difference, the net worth of a black family, which is about $17,000 and a white family, which is about $170,000, which is, by the way, pretty close to the um, value of a, of a home, starter home. But um, there's housing policy that helped drive that gap um, in our history, unfortunately. But nonetheless, if the question is, how might one close the wealth gap between those two population groups, I cannot think of a better solution than a black or brown owner of a company who has been located in business in neighborhoods where the needs are oftentimes very severe. Um, so we have an uncorrelated um, response, I think, to the problems um, that we're spending a lot of time thinking about on social construction. So much corporate philanthropy and so much capital has moved to um, advocacy and education and, and traditional organizations that are going to help us understand our history, maybe a bit whose fault it is that we got here. Not enough capital is going to exactly what you're calling for, 
which is the skills building, capital formation, market strengthening um, pathways with which we can solve the problem and create sustainable, durable solutions. Once we're past the pandemic, we're gonna have a lot of underlying issues that still need to be addressed. And those are economic equations. And so we need to be super rigorous about break, um, fixing the broken economies um, in too many of our urban neighborhoods and incentivizing non-traditional actors in the economy to be much more successful. Um, that's such a great response. There's a lot to unpack there. We might have to do that another time. Um, I want I want to ask Peter if, if Peter, will you please um, describe some of the specific examples of um, what you've done with the Growth and Resilience Project um, and sort of highlight um, a, a few of the uh, the people that have really stepped forward and been entrepreneurial. Um, before you answer, I just want to say that um, we all need to acknowledge that there are scores of nonprofits who are quietly working to um, solve these kinds of problems every day, COVID notwithstanding, not in a particularly flashy way. All of us are familiar with this kind of work and the people who do those things locally. And if you are a donor listening to this, please keep supporting those organizations in your backyard. It's, it's so important to sort of stick to um, supporting the bread and butter organizations. But um, Peter, could you describe some of, the, um, some of the really creative projects that you've been supporting through Donors Trust? Sure, I can share a couple of them. Um, and I see that Lawson Bader, our president, is on the line, who's much more intimately aware of a lot of these too. And uh, he'll, he'll, you know, he isn't a shrinking violet. So Lawson, if I screw any of these up or, or one of them's more important and a better example, jump in. Um, you know, a couple come to mind, one on the state level, one on the federal level. I mentioned the federal level one, which is the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and it's never needed campaign of asking if we didn't need these regulations right now when the world's falling apart why do we need them when things are pretty stable uh, and they have really pushed that message out uh, both to policymakers and a lot of an inside baseball strategy and then getting into the the regulator regulator uh, places to, to talk through these and point these hypocrisies out and then also communicating that out doing a lot of webinars and, and educational things for a broader populace. And this is something that, that will keep going. So we were able to give it that initial nudge with the grant, but now they've got other donors backing it as well and getting excited about it and, and kind of moving forward. And I think that's really great. Uh, down on the state level, the Beacon Center in Tennessee is a great example of a, a very entrepreneurial state think tank that, that wanted to do something. To, uh, and they actually have a unique situation where the governor turned to them and said, we'd love some ideas. Uh, and the the grant, so they they applied for funding from the Growth and Resilience Project uh, as they were putting this together to make sure that the ideas didn't just stop at the governor's desk, but that they had the resources to promote these to other policymakers, promote them out to the general public, uh, and they were really focusing on changes to medical licensing reform, uh, innovation waivers, uh, expediting the licensing process. I think they said they want to make Tennessee the, the fastest state to get a business license in the country. And so they really set these up. These are longer term goals, things they would want to do anyway, but the crisis offered them an opportunity to, to quickly catalyze some action in ways that might have taken years. Uh, and now they can do some emergency orders and work with the governor and build on that relationship and look to the future uh, and have built this, this campaign out so that come legislature time in January, the groundwork is laid to actually make some of these changes that are then going to lead to more businesses create, being created, more people being employed, uh, and, and a lot of very positive things. And interesting, one of the webinars we did with the Growth and Resilience Project featured somebody from uh, CEI and Beacon. Uh, that prompted a conversation where they said, we should be working together. And now you have these synergies forming out of uh, the two, just understanding what they're doing, which you know, I know all the donors on the call probably really appreciate it when they see organizations working together and see those dollars getting leveraged. And we were really excited to, uh, to see that. I'll give one more example. Um, Georgia Center for Opportunity, some of you may be familiar with their Hiring Well, Doing Good project. You know, the earlier you asked about projects that people would do anyway, and, and maybe you're you know, essentially looking for operating and not being creative. Uh, GCO is this interesting amalgam of that where 
hiring well, doing good was a project they were going to do anyway, it was already going, but all of a sudden it was needed more than ever. Uh, and so our grant allowed them to, to ramp up faster than they otherwise would and help some of those people more quickly get back on their feet that wouldn't have been able to connect to some of these employers that are out there. And, uh, and we thought that was a really great, great opportunity. I could go on and on, but, um, and actually, if anybody's interested in the full list of this, uh, you can go to donorstrust.org slash resilience. And we have all of our grantees for the project listed there and you can read about the projects. Uh, and if you're a philanthropist who really is engaged with, with this idea, uh, you know, we have three times as many or maybe four times as many organizations that applied than actually received funding. And so you can email me or email Lawson uh, and we can provide you that, that broader list if it's something that you would be interested in. Peter, those are terrific comments. I'd like to do a real quick add on to underscore your point about um, state level policy making. So we need to look less to the federal government, of course, um, in favor of market based actors and civil society champions. But this also could be a time um, where we could see heightened um, action among re reform oriented governors, as well as mayors. Um, people are paying a lot more attention to who their state and local officials are. Government closer to the people can be more effective. Lawson, Peter, and I were just at a terrific conference hosted by Taneo, a network of um, young conservatives who are trying to become more engaged in state and local level policy making. Alicia, you and I got our policy started in the 90s, which was really a heyday, a modern era heyday of state level innovation in education reform, housing vouchers, and of course, welfare reform. Um, conservative philanthropy or philanthropy um, if aimed at that level of policymaking um, could create a very dynamic environment um, for us to get many more of our citizens in the winter circle. Amen. This has been a great discussion of uh, the time has gone really quickly. And so we need to move to question and answer now. Um, I have two questions here that are, that are asking a similar thing. I'm going to state them both. And I think the answer will, can address both of them. Um, from Steve Moore, uh, what, if, what do we think um, is needed to put work in entre entrepreneurship more at the center of our current societal discussion about social, economic, and racial disparities? How do we get the wor word out and make it go viral? And similarly, how do we keep equality of opportunity as a focused measure of su success when others are seeking equity and inclusion in all situations? Peter, maybe I'll take that first since we're working on it. Um, well, I'd like to hear Steve Moore answer that question, actually. I don't know if that's an option, Alicia, but I, I, I'd find that edifying. Um, I'll take a chance at it. Um, I'll, I'll go back to the work that we're doing with Jalen Smith. I, I don't know how to do this macro. Um, I don't know a, a policy package that's going to get us from, from here to there. Um, what we're doing is, is taking a, a market building approach. So, for example, um, using Jalen's platform, Jalen Smith as, a, as an NFL player, we have pitch competitions, and we use the pitch competition as a way to gain visibility into the black and brown um, company builders um, in the state of Texas, for example, where we launched. We're able to get 150 companies to compete. We're able to source those companies on who is emerging, had a good idea, but hasn't built something yet, who has a good company, but not an investable company, somebody that has an investable company. So now we have business intelligence, and so we can support entrepreneurs all along that continuum, but they require different products and services. Somebody might need to learn how to read a balance sheet and to um, know when to hire an attorney and to do all the other things that a startup requires. Somebody else might just need to plug a few holes in the bottom of their boat. So maybe that's a business advisory set of services that um, we could come in to, to strengthen businesses. And then other uh, black and brown owned businesses simply need capital to scale. You may know that black owned businesses, I mentioned the number that failed um, over this past six months, but um, they get 1% of venture capital in America. Um, well, one reason that's true is because we do not have visibility into um, minority owned businesses. So if we're able to create that type of business intelligence, um, we will reward more entrepreneurs to get in the game um, in the Jim Crow era, um, we, which were a set of bad policies, 
we had a lot of amazing entrepreneurship. There were many African-American entrepreneurs in that time because they had to. Um, and we've disincentivized a lot of that behavior. If we could begin to incentivize it again um, by market rewards, um, which is capital um, for sure for those businesses that um, are investable, but skills building for those that, um, that need to improve. Um, we do the businesses no favor getting them capital when they're, they're not performing yet economically. I don't have anything else to add to okay. the stuff Just that you sure. um, So I'll ask a question to both of you um, about sort of a new generation of donors and their sort of habits and ideas. Um, when we talk about venture philanthropy um, for um, those of us in, in the sort of generation of donors that have been around for a long time, it, it sounds um, like a new idea. And I think it's more of a way of being in the world for um, younger folks. Um, they seem to care less about brand loyalty um, than they do about effectiveness. Um, and how do they define effectiveness? I wonder if you could say something about sort of the, whether they're patient enough. Um, do they have the humility uh, and sort of moving through the, the universe of impact investing to be, um, as my, my mentor Bob Woodson says, on tap but not on top, um, and uh, uh, provide their specific knowledge, um, but be deferential about those who know about the social dimensions of the work or the specific uh, policy dimensions of the work. So um, both of you just talk about um, sort of characterize young donors and what they're looking for and what they're missing as they proceed through this world. I'll chime in here briefly and then turn it to Jay. So we have a whole program focused on building up younger donors called our Nova Society. And when I talk to them, a lot of the times uh, what I hear from them is that they want to be involved. They don't always necessarily know what that means, uh, but they want to be involved in some way, shape or form. They want to feel the fact that they are, they are engaged in this. Uh, and so I think that's something to, that, that we need to keep in mind, that they're not just gonna give money and walk away. They wanna hear there needs to be a feedback loop and a communication loop from these groups about that effectiveness, as you say, Alicia, uh, because they wanna know that, that the money's moving the needle. And one thing we encourage is, and, and I think I see, is people thinking in smaller bets when they're younger and letting those bets grow. You know, Essentially being little venture philanthropists, as it were, and move fast and break things uh, before they become, you know, the, the old tier Facebook of move fast and have stable infrastructure. That's for later. Now they want to move fast and, and just see where, what happens if they give money to this thing. And I think that should be encouraged because right now, you know, $200 to six organizations uh, gives the donor enough information to figure out where should they give all of that money to one organization down the road. Yeah, I'll take a swing too at that uh, question. So um, maybe the caveat I'll say before is that um, what I'm about to laud as two remarkable trends in the millennial donor um, creates a little bit of danger in that the um, homeless uh, missions and, and other vital um, private volunteer organizations who require more traditional relief um, maybe are at risk um, in this new era where two trend lines are appearing. Um, a, a demand, an increasing demand orientation and, and the production of, of outcomes, which is terrific, bringing more business solutions to, to bear. And then capital on purpose. Um, so seeing not just their charitable activity, but, um, but their donor advised fund balances maybe, which can be used as impact investments but also, and maybe even more exciting, their full balance sheet and, and looking at the asset center management and their portfolios or, or even non-cash assets that could be mobilized to accelerate innovation and promising solutions. So I, I think that's super uh, exciting and not yet enough informed. So I do think that there's uh, another danger, a bookend danger, of not only maybe losing a little bit of uh, appreciation for some of the vital safety net organizations, um, but the move fast and break thing. Um, we don't necessarily need to move fast and break a bunch of things. We need to move fast and, and build a bunch of the, the right things. And so how can we create um, the knowledge sort of infrastructure you know, good think tank um, research and, and convening like this and, and other 
expectations uh, increasing behavior to say, look, um, we should demand um, really smart solutions on behalf of the nonprofits, but we should also be super informed on the, the capital side um, to be able to, which does require some business intelligence to make good decisions, but to, um, to move their capital in ways that does repair some of the broken um, economies I was referring to earlier. And so um, this is why I love the spontaneous order of the, the free market, um, but we do need to think better about it and we need to have um, maybe a more concerted research effort to be able to talk about non-traditional uh, investing and, and impact investing in particular in a way that drives uh, endurable market solutions. This will be our last question. Um, I guess, could each of you just say uh, in about two minutes per person, how you measure the impact of your investments? And I, I guess maybe not so much detail, but sort of more your philosophy of measurement with respect to the, um, the efforts that you're engaged in. Hey, why don't you? Sure, I can speak to, I uh, sort of keep the theme of our impact investing work. Um, we have a four part criteria and, and all the deals that, that we deem investable, that four boxes need to be checked are the strength of their uh, business plan, um, the math um, in their economic model about, you know, sort of their, their rate of return, um, their proven, um, record as operators, um, do they have the skills requisite to, 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 to run this business? And then is there some impact meaningful and measurable? Um, what we're seeing in the impact space that's quite uneven is that there are many deals out there where you can make a good rate of return. Oftentimes those deals don't have a very high social impact, or you can see a lot of social impact deals that have pretty questionable other three boxes. Um, they haven't done ha affordable housing before, or they, um, their numbers don't work or they haven't quite figured out their, their business strategy with, uh, with dynamism. And uh, so the diligence process, what it takes to, to build these deals um, is a place that does need to be more research informed because um, this is a new financial service, of course, um, to be charitable, but, um, but then also just, um, I think, again, expectations of the capital. If we're content saying, well, I don't do one thinking philanthropy, I do impact investing, and I can say that at a cocktail party and, and, and it'll sound good, um, without a conversation around um, the upfront diligence and the quarterly sort of management of results that views economic and social gain, um, then it is just talk. Um, so I think we should hold a very high standard. This is the beauty of a market solution. We can count things. Um, and, and, and if things are not working, we can problem solve against it because business is hard, but at least it's an objective, measurable um, sort of movement um, that, that should be unleashed here. Oh, I'll just Peter, very quickly add. Last um, word. Yeah, uh, just we were searching for things that were scalable, practical, and targeted. Uh, and, and so again, knowing those that going in helps us measure on the back end. And we were very clear about that with all the grantees at the start.